and reporter Nick Harper was listening to the hearing. He joins me live from Washington. So, Nick, we also heard testimony from two former members of extremist groups involved in the riot and the group's links to Trump uh, allies. Tell us about that. That's right, Andrew. Much of this revolved around a tweet that Donald Trump spent, sent on December the 19th, saying that there would be a big protest on January the 6th, saying it would be wild. Now, Democrats say that that was an explosive invitation to these far-right militia groups to descend on the US Capitol and to be prepared to fight. They say that he summoned a mob to Washington, D.C. We heard from one of the people who took part in that riot. He was asked why he came to Washington from his home state of Ohio. He said because on social media Donald Trump had tweeted that he should come here. And when he was asked why he marched on the Capitol, he said that Donald Trump told him to do that in the speech that Donald Trump gave just before the attack on the US Capitol. Uh, so the Democrats are very much trying to say that it was ultimately the former president that spurred on people not just to come to Washington, but then to descend on the US Capitol. We also heard from the former spokesperson of the Oath Keepers, a far-right militia group, and he essentially said that he was worried about the future and said that things could have been much worse on January the 6th. Let's listen to what he said. I think we've gotten exceedingly lucky that more bloodshed did not happen because the potential has been there from the start. And we got very lucky that the loss of life was, and as tragic as it is, that we saw on January 6th, the potential was so much more. Again, all we have to look at is the iconic images of that day with the gallows set up for Mike Pence, for the Vice President of the United States. You know, and, and I do fear for this next election cycle because who knows what that might bring. If, if a president that's willing to try to instill and, and, and encourage to whip up a civil war amongst his followers using lies and deceit and snake oil, and regardless of the, the human impact, what else is he going to do if he gets elected again? We also heard some of the links that Donald Trump's closest allies had to the Oath Keepers. Michael Finn, the former National Security Advisor, and Roger Stone, a longtime friend and Trump ally. The committee was shown pictures of how both men were guarded by Oath Keepers members on the day before and the day of January the 6th. The committee very much trying to portray that Donald Trump's inner circle had these very close personal links to these far right, right militia that descended on the US Capitol for that attack on the Capitol building. And Nick, a little earlier, the hearing was also told about some of the desperate measures that Donald Trump allegedly considered in an effort to cling on to power. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this is a meeting, Andrew, that took place the night before that tweet that Donald Trump sent uh, encouraging everyone to come to the US Capitol, a meeting that, we're told, took hours. Now, a group of fringe Trump allies managed to gain access to the Oval Office where they had a private meeting with the president for about 10 or 15 minutes, a meeting in which there were no White House representatives. Instead, people in the room uh, included Sidney Powell, a lawyer and also conspiracy theorist who was really trying to push Trump to overturn the election. Congressman Jamie Raskin, one of the Democrats on the committee, spoke about that meeting. This is what he had to say about what took place in that late night meeting. Friday, December 18th, his team of outside advisors paid him a surprise visit in the White House that would quickly become the stuff of legend. The meeting has been called unhinged, not normal, in the craziest meeting of the Trump presidency. The outside lawyers who'd been involved in dozens of failed lawsuits had lots of theories supporting the big lie, but no evidence to support it. As we will see, however, they brought to the White House a draft executive order that they had prepared for President Trump to further his ends. Specifically, they proposed the immediate mass seizure of state election machines by the U.S. military. 
quite an incredible idea that being pitched to the president that he could order with an executive order the US military to seize those voting machines and we're told that that meeting became a screaming match between those fringe uh, supporters of Donald Trump and the White House aides there were even threats of physical violence and this continued for many hours it was an idea that the president didn't go ahead with but the committee said that the frustrated former president then decided a few hours later to send out that tweet and it was that tweet that brought the mob to Washington DC. Nick thank you Nick Harper live in Washington and I want to bring in Chris Galdieri he's an associate professor in the Department of Politics at St. Anselm College and he's joining us from Manchester New Hampshire welcome to the rundown thank you for taking the time. Happy to be here. Thank you. So what is the key or what are a couple of the key takeaways for you that we learned from today's hearings? Uh, I think the biggest takeaway for me was the extent of the intentionality on the part of Trump and his White House uh, in terms of reaching out to these far right extremist groups, whether that be uh, through tweets that these groups saw as an invitation to come to Washington, D.C. and be prepared to uh, act violently, um, or through uh, the intercession of Roger Stone between Trump and groups like the Oath Keepers. Uh, previously, the uh, Trump world has said, well, this was just a normal speech that got out of hand. That is clearly and indisputably not the case anymore. Clearly, Trump was intentionally trying to reach out to these folks with a propensity for violence, with access to weapons and explosives to get them to come to Washington on his behalf in an attempt to overthrow the election. I mean, that is really staggering what you've just said. I mean, can you can you yes. kind of put that into some context in terms of that link that 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 was being made? Sure. Um, the, you know, these groups have been, you know, they've been out there on the fringes of politics. Um, what Trump did was really he was the most, I, I hesitate to use the word mainstream candidate or office holder, um, but he, he gave them legitimacy. He gave them validation. Um, he was a candidate who was not just holding them at arm's length, but a candidate who was willing to try to give them direct instructions, as we heard from that Twitter employee who, you know, looked at the analytics for that tweet and said, you know, there's something bad happening. You know, these folks are really responding to this. They're taking this as an invitation to try to go to D.C. on the 6th, and God knows what's going to happen then. And what did you make from the testimony that we heard from a former uh, Oath Keeper spokesperson as well as the, uh, uh, a Capitol Hill, a convicted Capitol Hill rioter? What struck me about that testimony is that uh, it put, first of all, uh, a human face on the people who went to the Capitol. You know, we heard from uh, Mr. Ayers about how, you know, to look at him, he was just a normal guy with a family working, making cabinets in Ohio, except he was immersed in this, um, you know, the social media world of conspiracy theories and far right agitation. Uh, and that led him to uh, decide to drive down to Jan to uh, Washington, D.C. on the 6th with a bunch of friends where he found himself uh, in the Capitol committing uh, committing a crime. Um, the other thing that struck me about the former Oath Keeper spokesperson um, is his warning that, you know, these folks are still out there, uh, that he's worried about what could happen in future election cycles. Uh, and so I think that was uh, really um, uh, damning and frightening testimony for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he said uh, we've gotten exceedingly lucky and he is very concerned uh, about the next election cycle that a president could whip up a civil war essentially so uh, you know when you when you think about that uh, how effective from a political point of view do you think they were in terms of trying to these were clearly Trump supporters they believed that the election uh, was stolen and yet they've renounced uh, those beliefs how effective were they at kind of bringing that out. Well, I think that you did see here an example of someone, of two people who had left that world and that sort of life behind. So on the one hand, I think that is sort of uh, almost an olive branch to people um, who might be in similar situations to say, look, you can walk away from this. You are not living in a world where you are getting the facts, where people are telling you the truth about what's going on in politics and in the news and that sort of thing. Um, on the other, uh, a lot of those folks aren't watching these hearings. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of those folks are, if they are watching those hearings, they are, you know, you know, just watching them to, you know, the same way that you would watch a, a bad movie to, to 
boo and hiss or something at it. Um, so I don't know how effective this is going to be in terms of uh, reaching folks, in terms of de-radicalization. Uh, I think the best thing I could say is it might be a first step for some folks. Okay. And then just finally, what about in terms of Republican and Republicans' uh, continued support for Donald Trump? Do you think that uh, these hearings are kind of eating away at that? Uh, I don't know that they're eating away at that. I think they are making some differences. Uh, if you look at recent polling, uh, you know, fewer Republicans are saying that they would support Trump in 2024 or want him to run again. Um, on the other, you know, Trump's numbers amongst Republicans are still pretty good. And I think the problem that the Republican Party faces is that an awful lot of their office holders uh, have looked at Donald Trump, have looked at the folks he brought out to support him and thought, gosh, I want some of that too. Uh, and until you have more Republicans who are willing to uh, join with Democrats uh, in defense of, if nothing else, uh, democracy and self-government, uh, you Republicans are really, you know, they're playing with fire here. It was really great to get your insight. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Thank you, Andrew. Chris Gallieri is an associate professor in the Department of Politics at St. Anselm College. He joined us live from Manchester, New Hampshire.